This week, we welcome Dr. Mike Lloyd. He's the CTO at Red Seal. We're going to be discussing the critical role of basic cyber hygiene. In the leadership and communication segment, five things successful people don't care about, 11 books that will change the way you think about leadership, how IBM wants to be the next Microsoft, starting with a new CEO, and more. All that and more, and Business Security Weekly, which starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Cybersecurity isn't only about stopping the threats you see, it's about stopping the ones you can't see. That's why Microsoft Security employs over 3,500 cybercrime experts and uses AI to help anticipate, identify, and eliminate threats. So you can focus on growing your business and Microsoft Security can focus on protecting it. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Microsoft Security. With over half of enterprise security budgets going towards detection and response in 2020, the challenge is investing in solutions that can scale, migrate, and adapt with your business. Cloud-native security solutions from ExtraHop are purpose-built to help your team respond to threats across the hybrid attack surface. Everywhere your enterprise exists today and wherever it goes tomorrow, ExtraHop is there to secure it. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome, everyone, to Business Security Weekly. It's episode number 162, recorded on February 10th, 2020, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, joined in studio by Mr. Jason Albuquerque. Hey, Jason, Paul, how are you doing? Good, good. I have, to, I have to admit something. You know, we, we usually talk about football yes. on Mondays. I actually went and started watching the XFL. Oh, yeah. How was that Eight going? Teams. Uh, not too bad. Better yeah. than I thought. Yeah. Um, knowing that it's owned by the WWE, I thought it was going to be a little bit more of a gimmick. Yeah, yeah. But it's not. It's actually more some, it's it's actually some real soon. football. Interesting. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Interesting. I'll have so to I needed my fix. I need my fix. I know, right? I, this is the time <laughs> where we, we don't have any football to, to talk about. So uh, it's good. It's good. So uh, join us at InfoSec World 2020, March 30th through April 1st at Disney's Contemporary Resort. Uh, a few things with this conference. Security Weekly listeners will receive 15% off the InfoSec World Main Conference or World Pass. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2020. Uh, Matt Alderman and I will be hosting a container security day talking all about how to securely uh, create and deploy containers. Uh, and we will be at the Vendor Expo Hall where we'll be uh, recording micro interviews. So if you work for a security vendor and would like to record an interview at the conference, you can get all the information you need at the same page, securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2020. Um, I'd like to introduce our guest for this segment. Mike Lloyd is currently the CEO, uh, at CTO rather, at Red Seal. He has more than 25 years experience in the modeling and control of fast moving complex systems. He has been granted 21 patents on security, network assessment and dynamic network control. Mike, welcome to the program. Oh, pleasure to be here. Uh, and of course, Mike is representing Red Seal. You can find out more about Red Seal at securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. Uh, Mike, it is wonderful to have you on the show. The topic uh, that we have at hand is the critical role of basic cyber hygiene. And I think it begs the question, what are the security basics? Because we often try and tackle that question <laughs> and uh, from different angles. And I want to get your take on it. Yeah, I mean, as an industry, we've, be, we've been chasing this for a long time, um, trying to figure out what the root causes are of all these breaches. And, you know, it's pretty clear that we're still missing a lot. Uh, if you look into uh, historic breach analysis, you find time and time again, it's very simple stuff that allows people in. And I think one of the lessons that we've had to learn the, the hard way is it's in this industry, we can't just go chasing silver bullet of the month for a threat vector of the month. It, uh, that, that's an endless treadmill, and you never really get any place. And that's not generally what you need anyway, To if you look back at the breaches that are occurring. What we're finding is that most organizations have an awful lot of gear. They've grown organically as a, as a business, and they've gotten very big and complicated. And a lot of mistakes have accumulated in that built-out infrastructure. And cleaning that out is really, really hard, but really, really important. 
what I'm finding is organizations know what to do, but it's very, very hard to do anything consistently at scale. Yeah. And, you know, that's what I think some of the nuances between when people ask, what are the basics? And then we talk about hygiene. Hygiene d alludes to that repeatable process that is uh, in. So what are some of the continuing processes we need to implement in order to have good security hygiene? Well, it, it certainly starts with visibility, right? You, you, yeah. you have to be able to even see what you own, you know, um, w whether you like the, uh, you know, the, the, the SANS or the NIST uh, mm -hmm. frameworks, right? They all start with inventory. And what I right. still find is most organizations, if I go and visit them, they can't produce a complete list of all their endpoints. Uh, they don't actually know where all their network fabric is uh, physically. And their cloud fabric, well, they've got some of it, but not all of it. So every organization that I meet, the most basic hygiene challenge is simply gathering all the data about where the organization is and then keep up with it as it keeps growing and changing. And so if you like, you know, when we think in today's world about coronavirus and the most important thing you can do about coronavirus is wash your hands a lot. Right. The equivalent of that for, for network hygiene is gather a good inventory. That's the thing you really have to pay attention to. Yeah. I mean, asset management and CMDB is, is kind of the, the central point, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't protect what you don't know about, right? And, and at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. You know, we talk to customers and they always don't have a complete um, sense of visibility or, or knowledge about their network, what's on the network, uh, the inventory that they have out there, never mind knowing how they interact with each other. Right and how those right. how those assets communicate with each other, what the dependencies are between those assets. I look at that as kind of the next stage of hygiene. Right, mm -hmm. is knowing the assets, but then knowing how they interact with each other is, is the next. Absolutely, phase. You know, the, uh, in interaction is is uh, a, a lot of the fancy stuff that I do. It's I, I do a lot of modeling of mm -hmm. network. Uh, interactions and looking at attack surface and trying to figure out how attack chains would work. But before you can do any of that That's kind right. of work, you've, you've got to get the basics together. Mm -hmm. And what I find is most organizations have resources that they haven't exploited well enough. So, so to do the kind of uh, network wargaming that I do, where I can uh, do attacks on a digital twin of, of some, somebody's network um, and then show them where the weak points are, I have to combine data from different sources. Right. So, so just, just backing up for a second for, from Red Seal, just when we go into an organization and we say, uh, give us all your vault scan data. So we'll use that to look at endpoints. OK, that's one data silo in an organization. And then we turn around to a different team. We go talk to the NetOps guys and say, why don't you give me a uh, complete inventory of the network? And we want to combine these two together. Think of it as a chess board and chess pieces. We're combining the chess board of the network infrastructure, mm -hmm. the, you know, the plumbing, and then putting the endpoints, the chess pieces into that. As soon as we do that, every place we go, we find those two teams must not have been talking to each other <laughs> because true. the data sets don't line up. Right, yeah. right. I, I even find many more silos right, uh, like that in organizations because mm -hmm. the network team, you know, they may have information and routing and switching, but then your mm -hmm. systems administrators might have some DHCP, DNS mm -hmm. style, right? And then your application teams yeah. and security teams have yet different views of the world. And no one has a complete picture right. of everything. Right. Then well, throw in data analytics teams, teams, right? right. You, 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 you mentioned completeness. And one, yeah. of, one of the things that we learned was if you look at the, with an organization, you think about all those data silos. You're thinking about the organizational politics that, that, that happens as an organization gets big. The only team who actually cares about that word that you used, completeness, mm. is the security team. True. Right. Yeah. You know, the NetOps team, they're paid on uptime. They just care about availability. And if they have a 90%, 95% complete inventory in their config store, eh, good enough. Right. So when we go and look at a typical NCCM system or a CMDB, you know, it'll often be maintained by NetOps and it'll be somewhere in the 80 to 90% complete range because that's enough to get them their bonus. Right. right. It, it right. gets them paid. Only security has this obsession with, I need 100%. <laughs> it's and we're true. Right, of course. It's, it's true. I, I've spoken with many uh, enterprise security teams, and uh, a, a subsection of those, when we talk about asset inventory and discovery, they know that it changes on a daily basis, and they know that there's the best teams have that 1% you know, variance yeah. that... I'll never know about that 1% because it's changing from day to day. And their question to me is, how do, how do I get to that, that 1% and make it 100%, not 99, mm -hmm. right?
I don't, th th yeah, th th that's an excellent question. And so, some of the effective te techniques we found, um, actually, I stumbled into by accident, right, when we when we uh, started doing this kind of uh, attack simulation on, on customer networks so that we could give them risk scores and show them attack vectors, all, all the complicated stuff. It starts by combining two, two data feeds together. And what we found was that's actually a really good way to go looking for that last 1%. If you look, for, look at the inconsistencies between your data feeds, uh, that's uh, prime yeah. security signal. Mm. Now, I, honestly, I was quite slow to figure that out. It, um, I, I used to, you know, to just show people uh, the overlap when I found endpoints that landed in the network map. That was mm. great. And we mm -hmm. talked about that. We didn't really talk about the fact that we found some endpoints that didn't seem to have any network. Um, we found some network that seemed to have tumbleweeds blowing through it. There was nothing going on there. Right. Um, and we only later did we realize, no, no, if you're looking for that 1%, if you're looking for completeness, what you can do is take your data feeds and combine them together. And, and from finding the disconnects between them, that's how you have more than one view in, into your organization. Yeah. So you can go hunting for those 1% those corners where the bad guys hide. Yeah. Mm. Now, now, Mike, I mean, it, if organizations are struggling today with getting an inventory of on-prem, now, now throw in the complexity of cloud, right? And, and, and making sure, you know, making sure that teams know and have that visibility. You well, know, they know when they get the bill. That's they, what we find. They know when they get the bill, but most <laughs> likely it's another team managing the cloud strategy right. as well, right? Yep. So, so you have your IT operations, you have your applications team, and now you have this cloud team, well, right? It, and, and they're not all connected. Sam just came to me. And she's like, the, the bill was a little different. She's like, does that come down to the work you've been doing at AWS? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, good that we noticed. Good that we right. noticed. But your bill yeah. might be higher, but that's still it, translating that into exactly which assets were spawned up and down in that time frame exactly. is a different thing, right? Yeah. And, yeah, how, they're, and how they're connected to your corporate network. Right. You know, I mean, that, that, that's a huge complexity that you could be spinning up resources and compute, you know, on demand at this point, and, and you don't know how it's interconnected into your on-prem network. So right. most organizations are hybrid. Yeah, absolutely. And you've touched there on the two main ways that we see people trying to go at this, right? So, so cloud has indeed meant the, the pendulum swings back and forth over decades between centralization and decentralization. And it's obvious we're in a big decentralization wave now, where instead of going through central IT, any VP with a credit card can go out and build right. some cloud services. And you have to keep up with all that. And your two main ways of getting at that, you mentioned both of them. One of them is looking at your bills. If you're in security, talk to your own procurement people and try and figure out who, who's paying for all this stuff so that we can just get it into our inventory. Right. The other way is to look for connections back into your network. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, of the two, the second one seems to work better in practice. Because as you found, even with your, your story there about just a small scale organization with the finance person coming to you and saying, is this bill correct? She had no idea who to ask to start with, right? And if you're in a much larger organization, right. it's really, really hard to track back from somebody in procurement knowing something to somebody in security realizing, oh, wait, you mean we got some more VPCs that we didn't know about? Yeah, exactly. So the connections back to the fabric, though, can be very useful. If you're already building a good inventory and you can see where your VPN concentrators are, where you can see that IPsec is coming into the building, those can be a great source. Because anybody doing a toy project, okay, maybe they don't have to connect back to the mothership, but mm -hmm. anybody doing a serious bit of work for your company, if they've got crown jewel data mm -hmm. out there in the cloud, they have to get it into the cloud, and there's usually some fingerprint of that that you can pick up in the legacy network. And, and that's where the work is, right? I mean, I love that we can go all the way back to the cuckoo's egg, right? And know that that story started because of an accounting error. And right. the story unfolded as they traced it back. And it's the tracing it back that's the work. Yeah. Right. And and, and unfortunately, I, you, you may have seen this, but I'm finding the cloud providers for their own, I think, possibly sensible reasons are not being as helpful as they could be. <laughs> it's very true. Absolutely. Say, I work for company X. Can you tell me everybody you send a bill to at company X so I can go talk to them? The answer largely today is still no. I'm sorry, we can't do that for privacy reasons. I, I get why that's a challenge, but it's mm -hmm. a real blocker for security teams trying to figure out who's buying all the Amazon, all the GCP, all the Microsoft stuff. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about prioritization, right? Because once we've got uh, as best the asset inventory we can get, and obviously every uh, organization is going to be different, how do we prioritize? And, and I guess it's more along the lines of, um, do you look at where you might be missing controls, just knowing what those controls should be? Or do you look at what attacks uh, and threats are coming at you and how do you develop a priority based on either internally what's missing or maybe do you prioritize on externally what might be coming at you or both? Yeah, I uh, know it, it, it's a great question because we're, we're all overwhelmed in, with too many facts, too many vulnerabilities, too many weaknesses, not enough people, not enough time to fix it all. Right? Uh, you know, it's, so prioritization is, is the name of the game. 
And so there are a lot of different ways to do it. But the the, the prime one that I show customers uh, how, how to do is, is wargaming. Um, you know, attack your own organization. And you, you, you can do that with expensive, you know, red team uh, contractors who will come in and, and attack your real organization. And that, that can be the only way to find human weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But on the technology side, you can do pretty well at building out a, a model of your infrastructure and attacking that and then see, look, in my organization right now, the easy way to break in is to compromise this or get a fish to this point in the network and then look at the blast radius. So what, what I end up doing for a lot of organizations is calculating blast radius. The, the trick with that is this is then an integration point uh, with other technologies. I know you, you guys have, have covered a lot about the value of integration. And, and certainly what, one of the things that uh, when, when you look at Red Seal as part of a wider uh, integrated world, one of the things we can provide is blast radius to say, if you're looking in, a, in your SIEM at an alert at one location in space, how bad is that? Where else could somebody go from here? What, what blast radius does it have? And so that helps to prioritize because you, you look for the signals that have the large blast radius where somebody can uh, compromise th the most from that location in the network. So Mike, essentially you built the Whopper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should call it. That'd be awesome, right? <laughs> it, it, it has taken a little while to because uh, it, it, it's quite tough to to, to n understand all of the nuances of all of the different controls. Because you, yeah. you mentioned, you know, uh, do you have a problem like uh, do you have controls missing or things like that? But to, to actually effectively be able to system test an organization, you have to actually understand what all the controls are. And there happen to be quite a lot of them in use, right? Yeah. Again, you, you, you guys cover a lot of this, but depending on who, whose count you like, we've got somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 vendors in this space right now, um, depending on wh whether you count the ones who are funded or not. Um, and that, that's an awful lot of different control technologies to keep track of. Um, so it's, it, you know, it, it's a problem for customers as, as, as well as for me. I don't, I don't mean to whine about that it's difficult to, to keep up with all this. It's really the customers who have the challenge of trying to track all these different technologies and figure out which ones really matter. Um, yeah, it's that, interesting. That, you know, we can do the kind of tabletop threat modeling exercises with data points that we know about. Obviously, computers and, mm -hmm. and AI is much better at performing those models. Uh, that I feel is a step that's missing because we often go from theoretical, whether we've had a pen test or not from an, mm -hmm. an external red team, we take this theoretical approach of here are the uh, paths into my, in and out of my network, right? Then we kind of skip over that computer modeling and we go right to, well, let's see how this attack does and this attack yeah. does, right? With breach and attack simulation, which I think is good to test like rubber meets the road, test your defenses. But I like this step in between where we can model and, yep. and get the computer's help in understanding all of these different aspects um, that I think on either side of that, you're kind of missing out on, on certain aspects of your security posture. Yeah, I mean, I look at that as overall situational awareness, right? Yes. The potential, like you've mentioned, the blast radius, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can get some point in time tests, like you said, but, you know, what is that that 30,000 foot view of what could potentially happen in that situational right. awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think the, the, way, the way I've tried to think about how to pull this together, because you, you, you're right, that it, uh, it's very important to make sure your tabletop exercises are not just theoretical. Mm. I mean, you really are fighting a war. And if you look at commanders in a war, you know, in any movie or any uh, historical photographs, what are they doing? They're standing around a map. And that's not a map of a theoretical war game. That's the right. real war mm -hmm. they're looking at on that map. And you've got to make sure you're doing that. And if, if I can run with a military analogy for a second, you know, you're talking about how to, how to make sure these exercises are practical and really do things. Um, th th there's a good old fashioned uh, military idiom that I found is very, very helpful for thinking about where we are as a security industry at this point. This is this thing known as the OODA loop. Yep. Now, I, yep. you know, Red, Red Seal's hardly the only vendor who talks about this. I think you, you, you've covered some of this before. Oh, but, it was um, a fighter pilot, mm -hmm. Boyd something Boyd. Yes, yep. uh, right. Colonel John Boyd's the John guy. Boyd, yeah. uh, you know, you're quite right. He was thinking about who wins dogfights. Is mm -hmm. it the guy with the better plane, more years of training, better stick and rudder skills? What, what, what is it? And it's the, the guy with the fastest OODA loop. That's observe, orient, decide, act. So what you do in a dogfight is you cycle around these four things mm -hmm. really fast. You have mm -hmm. to see the other plane. You have to figure out what that means in relation to you. You have to figure out what you're going to do about it. And then you've got to go take your action. And obviously, if you miss any one of those four, you're in trouble. But yep. the, the trick is to get around them quickly. And I, I'm, I'm on your point about how do you make sure threat modeling isn't just some tabletop theoretical exercise. What you do is you figure out how you run your organization's OODA loop. Mm -hmm. And strategically, you figure out how you can make it faster, 
not mm -hmm. better, richer, or I'm going to tweak around with even more observe, right? Because when we do these four things in, in corporate networks, we, we're drowning in, a, in the first step, in observe. Mm -hmm. We have some good things in decide and act, right? I, I see a decide as being where your SIEM fits, mm -hmm. right? You can map mm -hmm. most of your security technologies into OODA. So we've got loads of observe, a little bit of decide, and act. That's where the source stuff is going on at the moment. That's, that's yep. pretty interesting stuff, right? I, I think there's reason to think we can get better at acting faster, more efficiently. But observe is the, is, is the step that people miss a lot. And that, that's why that t you want your threat modeling not to just be some tabletop exercise. Mm. You want it to be part of how you go from observe to decide and act. If you try and do it without orient, map it down to me, to the blast radius or mm -hmm. my cyber terrain. If you can't see the, that event in your cyber terrain, then you're skipping one of the four critical steps that John Boyd identified for fighting uh, in a dogfight. And I, I love that. I think that's a great point, Mike, because it's the orient step that I think most people are struggling with, right? Because exactly. they get all this data from all these different points, right? And they're trying to automate it mm -hmm. to get to that decision to be automated and acting, but they're not orienting. What that means is that your SOC teams, for example, are responding to every single little thing. Regardless of the priority, right? Because you're not orienting. Yep. Well, it could be just wipe all those machines in that area, right? When maybe it was just one machine. Maybe it was something you didn't even really need to uh, warrant that level of response. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's right. largely what's missing from folks' software programs. And, and at the end of the day, that orientation is the situational awareness you need right. to be proactive in your decisions and how you act upon them, right? Yep. So, so getting that important information bubbled to the top, because we are. We're swamped in data. Mm -hmm. You know, security professionals are swamped in data all day long. And I always ask the question, how do you bubble the most important information to the top so we can make good decisions and then we can act on them, to your point. Right. It, it's the same military uh, Air Force people who, who uh, focused on situational awareness. That's mm -hmm. where we got that term from. It's the same people trying to deal with the same saturation, right? If you're in the middle of a dogfight, do you need to know that your fuel tank is down to about quarter full? No, that's now a low priority signal. Mm -hmm. In a different context, that would be possibly the most important signal. But yeah. in the middle of a dogfight, you need to suppress that one because your situation is different. Whereas a terrain alert, that's still kind of important, even in the middle of a dogfight. <laughs> Like that's something you could miss that really matters. Exactly. And this is why the, the, the military thinkers, they, they, they also say Orient is the most important of these. If you read Boyd's stuff, he, he yeah. talks about the fact that you, know, you need to do all four, but Orient is the most important thing. You've got to figure out what it means to you, not mm -hmm. just what it means in general. Another area where I feel like folks are drowning is in configuration management. And, you know, with my vulnerability management background, I feel like we spend a lot of time focusing on the patching aspect, which to me is just an extension of configuration. But where people are drowning today is in configuration. When we talked about networks, you know, switches, we talked about endpoints, we talked about cloud. The number of configuration options just in those three areas alone are just extremely overwhelming, which is why I feel people still just go back to firewalls, patching, and antivirus, right? Because it's something right. we can know and do. But how do we get people over to getting a hold of all of that configuration data and prioritizing it to configure things to be more resilient? Well, now, now th th this is an area where I, I definitely have strong opinions, but it, it's about the division of labor, the correct division of labor between humans and computers, right? When, when we're doing work, we tend to want quite linear to-do lists. And that's mm -hmm. it, the, all the things you talked about, about just cleaning out the firewalls, uh, you know, applying the various patches, making sure your vuln scans are done. These are all linear jobs. Okay, I've got to go take these, you know, and maybe the list is very long. But I can sort it using prioritization, and I'll just start working from the top, and I'll take the top 10 things today. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very linear way of doing work. But the network, as you said at the very outset, the network is defined by complex interaction of multiple parts. And that's the thing that humans are not very good at. That's where machines are such a big help, because machines can exhaustively go looking for combinations you don't think of. So you, can, you, you could have a really tight program for patch management at an organization, or you might have really good following of hardening guides. And uh, let's say if you're in the military, you might use disastigs as your way of making sure that all your network gear are following all the checklists. That's great. Checklists are good. They have their place. But if you want to find the complex interactions, that's really tough for a human. And this, this is why, you know, if you think of like, like a chess computer, right? Chess computers are really, really good at exhaustively hunting through many, many moves of, oh, if you moved over here, then moved over here. And th th this is what we need for that real configuration hygiene. You can't do network control just from a bunch of checklists. That's, that's like uh, looking at a building and making sure I've checked each cement brick that's mm -hmm. gone into the building has been built correctly. Right. Well, that's great, but that doesn't tell you whether the building as a whole is sound. The only way you can do that 
is to look at it as a system. Um, it, you know, seismologists will, will use a shaking table. They'll take a model of your building, the complete model, and they'll put it on a shaking table and shake it until it falls down. And now they know its limits. And that's some of what we do in uh, modeling people's infrastructure. So they can find things that you, you can't get with checklists and just working in a linear human way through, I'm going to make sure this box is following the hardening guide, then this box, you know, one brick at a time doesn't tell you whether the whole building is going to stand yeah. up or fall down. And, and what I think we mistakenly uh, use priority to mean is like what's going to maximize the efficiencies and resiliency of my network, right? And that's mm -hmm. not necessarily, like you said, very linear list. Yeah. I just want to know what's the highest priority thing. It's less about priority, more about, well, when you model it, if you make these one or two configuration changes, now you're X amount more resilient to right. attacks based on the models. And, yeah. and that I think is extremely valuable to teams today. Yeah. Yeah, th th there's, there's an irony in, in the security space these days where, you know, you've got your tactics and your strategy. And we're talking a lot about how people focus on the tactical day-to-day -day work of patch a thing here, go, um, you know, remove a vendor-supplied password on a piece of kit over there, m make my Wi-Fi a little more solid, right? Th th there's a lot of that day-to-day uh, -day tactics you need to do. People would think of that as the boring work and, and strategy would be a much more positive word. Oh, yeah, I want to go focus on strategy. <laughs> Except if you really think strategically about where we are as a security industry, most of the strategic recommendations are kind of boring. They're, they're mm -hmm. kind of unsexy, right? They're things like you need to go and eliminate 100% of the vendor supplied passwords. You need to make sure that you've got a complete inventory. So sometimes we end up sounding like, like dentists talking to people about flossing their teeth, right? <laughs> we, we have to keep reemphasizing the basics over and over mm -hmm. and over. But that, unfortunately, is, is you know is the strategic thing to do at the moment. It's not go chase the latest whiz bang, uh, you know, a, 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 AI washed uh, vo voodoo machine that has some crazy capabilities. It's go back to the basics, go back to hygiene, and make sure you do things consistently at scale. And what I love about that too is I can extrapolate that and say it's it's more about the process that I implement, a new process that I implement that just makes the exposures that I found completely irrelevant, right? Like it could be some kind of authentication, right? Mm -hmm. But if I make it really easy in my process that the password rotates or the keys rotate very often, then I've just fixed that problem more with process, maybe some technology, and I don't have to worry about, okay, I got to go change all these vendor passwords, you know, yeah, every yeah. week, right? Yeah. And that's my, my tactical thing to your point, right? right? I want to yeah. have that process that just makes things irrelevant in terms of exposures to my, my data and my network. Oh, good sound that's processes right. is ultimately what's going to get you to the good outcome, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, you can, you know, we talked about it. You can put a nice blinky flashy light on top of a bad process. It's mm -hmm. going to be crap. So at the end of the day, you need a sound process to be able to overlay that technology on to, to be able to protect your organization or get the visibility into the organization that you need. Right. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. And this goes, goes back to the good news, bad news with mm -hmm. the cloud now, right? The good news is the cloud is getting many IT professionals who aren't security people to think that way, mm -hmm. to think of compute yeah. assets as being replaceable, you, that, that you can uh, discard uh, a, a server and rebuild it. Maybe they maybe they think of it for HA reasons, but we think of it as I need to go back to a gold standard. I need mm -hmm. to make sure that anything that might have been infected uh, won't stay up very long. And so, so we are moving towards a world where you can uh, respin and have good process and have tools to uh, actually make the infrastructure do what you want quickly. The, the bad news of that is okay, yeah, but all networks are hybrid now. So there's a part of it that moves very fast and very flexibly like that, mm -hmm. and a part of it that still moves the old-fashioned way. And there isn't any Im imminent prospect that I see of that going away. And so you inherit all of the problems, all of the uh, old problems that we had, but also the new problems that right. come with cloud. Right. And now you have to worry about all of this. And you know you boil it all down, and the complexity only ever goes up. Yeah, yeah. Sort of and those so are huge, they're huge blind security. spots, right? I mean, at the end of the day, as, as, as a CISO myself, I look at those as blind spots in my organization. And, and I mean, for, for, for folks like myself, what are some that, that are afraid that they don't have good visibility or, or knowledge of their network or they're walking in the door fresh? What, right. are, what are some good one to two things that they can do to kind of hit that ground running, get that situational awareness, get that ability to orient quickly? Um, just some best practices that you could let our yeah. audience know about. Well, we, we, we already talked a little bit about combining data sources, right? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, over about 10 years of doing this, um, I found that you can really do a lot if you squeeze the data you've got and ask it questions about what data you haven't got. Mm -hmm. You can actually find a lot of those blind spots by taking 
you know, um, a faulty data feed, right? I know a lot of people in, in the scenario you're talking about where they're just inheriting an organization, they're trying to hit the ground running, and they think, oh my God, if, if I ask the people about the CMDB, they all tell me they don't trust it, that it's rubbish, <laughs> that it, you know, it's out of date, it's got holes in it. Yeah, of course, all that's true. That's true everywhere. But if you take that data feed and you ask it, okay, what evidence is there in here of what else is missing? You can do remarkably well with that. It goes back to Rumsfeld's thing about known unknowns. Most organizations I know have really a quite good uh, amount of data, uh, starting with a limited set of knowns, and from that you can extract the known unknowns. So a couple of ways to do that, right? It, 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 if you've only got one data feed, like say uh, some Voln scans, you can look for, for gaps inside it. Uh, or if you've got some network configurations, you might find dangling links or routes to devices that aren't in your inventory. And just to actually check for that is really important. But the best thing really is to combine data feeds. Like we, we talked about earlier, if you take two data feeds, especially if they come from different teams who have different perspectives, if you take those two data feeds, I guarantee they're going to draw a different size elephant, right? They're, they're not, mm-hmm. you know, the elephant is your organization and no single organization is going to have the entire yeah. elephant in, the, in their view. But if you can take their various points of view around the elephant and combine them, that's where the, the gold is when you're trying to hit the ground running, as you say, and, and try, trying to uh, fill gaps in, in your knowledge as quickly as you can. And, and now, once you get that context, you bring all that data together, you create a context, right? How important is it to get that level of shared responsibility where you're bringing all the teams in a room, now you're asking about the gaps, right? I mean, I've always, I've always thought of getting the most eyes on data as possible gets you to that outcome quicker. So, you know, you can gather all these pieces of information from different teams and different log sources that different teams own. But at the end of the day, bringing them back together, I think, gives you context faster because they understand what those log sources are giving you for data, right? And how they interact with each yeah. other. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the organizational politics of this is really very subtle. Mm. But you, know, you do have to realize that the different teams have different interests. Yeah. And most security teams have to learn some, uh, if, especially if they're going to reach out, say, to, to NetOps. Um, they have to have a cookie. They have to have something they can give them. <laughs> and helping yeah. uh, un- understanding what they want is, is important. And as I say, one of, one of the unique things about the security team is, is we're so obsessed with completeness. But actually, the network teams tend to like it if we can go back to them and say, look, instead of spanking you with some compliance findings or something, mm-hmm. how about I work with you to take your inventory and I'll show you there are holes in it and gaps in it. And I'll show you what we need to go gather together so that we get what we need and you get a more complete picture. Yeah. And they appreciate that. Yeah. So you, 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 if, if you want to get those different teams together, you can. They just do have different perspectives, right? They, they're, they're all paid in a different way. They're, they're, their yep. managers want different things out of them. And you have to respect that and figure out how to give them something that they want. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, you're basically helping them mature their CMDB or their asset management database, right? Exactly. So that's great. That's a great give and take. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Always uh, pitch it as helping them, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's what it, we're here it, for. Exactly. You, you have to figure out that, that positive. Otherwise, you're just, you're just you know, the guys who say no and mm-hmm. who come by yeah. and spank them once, yep. once a year yep. for the audit. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for appearing on Business Security Weekly. It was wonderful having you. Our listeners that want to learn more about Red Seal can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. Pleasure. Great Thanks to meet you. Lot. With that, we'll take a short break, talk about the leadership articles for this week. Stay tuned.